text to you at the end if I've got your email addresses. If you've pre-registered, then you've done that, so that's okay. Um, and welcome to what I would like to call Sales Reimagined, really, which is looking at the changing face of sales and looking at how you can influence that in terms of driving your business forward in what we can only describe have been pretty uncertain terms, um, you know, in terms of where we are in terms of times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, we're doing the changing face of, of, of um, slideshow from current. I'm not going to do a full slideshow all the way through, but I do show some slides because I think that some of them have got some visual impact. Okay, so um, what I would say to you is. Sales has been changing for a while. It's not just COVID, but COVID's definitely accelerated the, the whole way we deal with things. So even before COVID, there were changes afoot in how people manage their sales activity, their sales function. What COVID has done, it's made us very inaccessible when it comes to what I would call the old fashioned sales representative and you know going to networking doing exhibitions following up with visits getting clients to come to your site it's all a lot more challenging but actually um sales haven't held what i call held the aces for a long time so why do we think that sales have not been in control of the sales process for i think certainly four or five years why do we think that that they haven't been in charge of the sales process anymore any ideas anyone want to unmute and share with me or the group what what's your thoughts on why sales people who said that i'm gonna have to do it on speak of you so that we can when, whenever someone okay so put, somebody put the thumb up and let and share with me why they think sales people have, have lost the uh the control of the sales function any ideas I think um, there's more um, people looking online um, and more competition. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people just using the powers of Google just to be able to Google a product on there and then they see it, you know, a non comparable product, but like a cheap product or a, a similar product in their eyes. Absolutely. What used to happen was um, in return for a payment, a sales professional would share knowledge, information, technical detail, specification information, etc. And they would share their ideas and tips. The challenge now is you don't you can't really do that because your customers are coming to the table probably much more aware than they ever were. They've got research tools, there's lots of free materials, there's lots of information available on the internet, research capability. So if you're a technical salesperson, the chances are your customers are much more educated than they used to be. And on that basis, they are already prepared for a further developed conversation than they were in the early stages of, of old fashioned sales repping. So the internet, YouTube, how to guides, technical specifications, competitor analysis has done all of that to the sales uh, cycle. But what's also happened, as I mentioned earlier with COVID-19, is it's the accessibility that we then struggle with. Because whilst, you know, I was working with a group of companies yesterday and four of those, four of those businesses have traditionally generated 80% of their work through exhibitions. You know, these big international exhibitions once a year or twice a year that then generate huge amounts of leads on a very technical big ticket item approach. And they're no longer available to them. And there's lots of things happening that have, have changed the dynamic to make sure that we have to now change, which is what the purpose of this kind of workshop came out of me working with various clients and saying, so what do we do? How do we do it? So sales works very differently now, and it works on what I call the push pull axis okay it's about pushing your expertise your relevance your content it's pushing your um kind of uh influence out through a variety of channels to allow people to be pulled in 
when they are doing that research we talked about earlier. So when we are talking about, I'm looking for someone who does whatever, they've already seen the activity, the, the content, the relevance, the technical capabilities through the content that's being pushed out by you as an individual or potentially by your organization. And what it comes down to is what I call thought leadership, okay? Does anyone by way of a little reaction button at the bottom know what thought leadership is? Anyone want to hazard a guess or what they believe that the term might be? Some of you might have heard of it, some of you might be unaware of it. Um, a little thumb up or reactions button or a physical thumb up if you're on video. Anyone know what thought leadership is? Karen Tinkler. Uh, Karen, to you, what would you say thought leadership means to you? Uh, it's what it's what clients always ask us to be. Um, we're a PR agency and we they want us to help make them thought leaders. And it's being seen as being the leader in their industry, the the authority, the the source of knowledge, information, the experts, that yeah. kind of thing. It's almost being the default go to person or organisation. <laughs> I don't like the word influencer because it makes you sound like you want to be Kim Kardashian. And you know, I'm not sure that any of us have got aspirations to be Kim Kardashian particularly, but uh, in terms of influence, it's really about driving content that says you are really relevant, interesting, capable, and you are a person that I want to be drawn to when I'm looking for a particular product or service. So I specialize in a couple of areas, but sales is in my DNA. So if you cut me in half like a stick of Blackpool rock, it would say sales throughout that. So anytime I'm creating content or pushing content out or using channels to communicate, whether it's commenting on something, sharing some white paper research, it's usually going to be around the sales function. And I get about 80% of my business through referrals or through the one channel I do use extensively, which is LinkedIn. And people come to me and go, <clears throat> are you the guy who can do whatever around the sales function? <clears throat> and it's because I've spent a long time with a content strategy, pushing the right content out to people and I push it out and it pulls them in. And what you've got to think about is which platforms which content, how regularly do you need to be producing materials? So I'm going to ask you collectively, how many of you have got a content strategy that supports your sales strategy for the business? How many of you have got one? Josh Park, you, you shook your head to say no. Can I take you off mute or take yourself off mute for me and, and, and say why you said no? Then what's your role, Josh, and what's your business? Uh, so I'm like a technical sales engineer um, uh -huh. within the marine industry, but I've got my own LinkedIn account uh, and sales navigator and everything. But um, I think more of the marketing on LinkedIn is down to our marketing department. So I personally don't have anything that I put out for my own account. It's more just for meeting leads and mm. speaking to clients. Uh, so, in you're, so you're using LinkedIn traditionally as a lead generator. Yeah, no, more. It's not yeah, generally a push a push tool as it were yeah yeah that's right yeah okay not unusually by the way josh um but you work in a specific industry you mentioned there marine mm. so whilst it's a big industry it's got a finite number of players and a finite number of suppliers and so how do you think about getting josh parker and the company at the top of the pile in a marine industry where people are talking about you because you are either you or your marketing department are creating valuable content. And we'll talk later about what that valuable content might look like. So when you work in those kind of sectors, it's a really good opportunity sometimes missed because you're not pushing the, the, the expertise, the relevance and using LinkedIn as you do, you're asking people to connect with you sort of blind a little bit Mm. rather than thinking i want to connect with you because wow look at the stuff this guy's producing and he's obviously the go-to guy for this particular you know technical solution or whatever it might be has anyone got a connected content strategy that links to their sales function anyone got that 
bit of work for clients for you there, Karen, I suspect. Karen Tinkler, Partners Group, <laughs> just introduced now. Right. What I'd say to you is, if you don't have a content strategy that links to your sales function, your sales function is missing probably one of three or four strands and it's going to be unbalanced because it makes it harder work. You're constantly having to push, 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 but you're not getting any drag back. You're not, the phone isn't ringing. The people are not coming to you. It's all front foot proactive sales. Sometimes you get the content strategy right and the phone rings, the inquiries come in, the channels work and they heat up. So it is about putting yourself out as someone of relevance. Now, Sarah Birkinshaw, I'm surprised you haven't put your hand up to that. You're like all over the place in a good way. I see you all over, Sarah. You, you've got LinkedIn posts. You share some really, you're a HR consultancy practice. That's right, isn't it? Yep. And, so and you, I do. I should have put my hand up, Nick. I'm sorry. I was going to say, your, your friend of mine, Marianne Smith, will kill you for not doing that, by the way. Uh, but what, just, I would say, what I would say to you is, your content strategy, it's not about, hey, buy from me, look at me, I want to sell you something. Your content strategy, and it was brilliant in the early days of lockdown, was you might need advice about your people. You might need advice about furlough. You might need advice about how do I structure bringing people back. And you gave all that information out to people as a, a really valuable asset. I bet your phone rang. I bet your LinkedIn channels picked up. I bet your inquiry levels increased. And not because you said, please sell me something or can I sell you something? Because people said, this lady is an expert. This lady is knowledgeable. This lady is relevant. And that's one strand of a content strategy that elevates you. Because I know you're based in West Yorkshire. And even in West Yorkshire, how many HR consultancy practices will there be? You were the most visible, viable, you were the most um, helpful and the most relevant at a time when people needed it. And I think what that's done is it's, t it's changed your game, I would imagine, in terms of how you see uh, your business and how people see you. So that's what a content strategy is designed to do. So um, I'm glad you said yes in the end, Sarah. So I, I, otherwise Marianne would have to you know, have a word with you. So, but we're going to look at, the, the, the typical sales funnel. This used to be how a sales funnel worked. But what I want to say to you is, it still does. You still have to raise awareness. You still have to engage and interact with a potential customer. You still have to generate that interest and get them to take action. And the action is obviously by the product or service that you're providing. So the, the a simple four-stage sales funnel is still relevant, but the execution is significantly different. So we're gonna spend some time looking at the significance of the, what I call my sales cycle. There are about eight areas of the sales cycle, but it starts with the sales strategy. So what I'm gonna ask again, collectively, I'm always looking for volunteers, and if you're not on video, you can still put your thumb up on the reactions button to contribute. Um, I'd like to ask, have any of you got, as a business, or an individual, but hopefully as a business, a defined sales strategy, i.e. structured, you know what it includes, you know, you know what your ambitions are, etc. Who's got a defined sales strategy for their business? Anyone? Come on, you're either not contributing or you are absolutely here because you're a basket case for sales and I suspect it's not the latter. Some of you have got a sales strategy, come on, come on. I'm not going to come to you, Karen. Charlie Mealy, you've got a sales strategy. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I mean, I'm probably here under, under um, in the wrong frame of mind because I guess at the minute I feel like I'm not completely there, but definitely with the work that you and Marianne are doing, um, I do and I probably just need to get my head around it a little bit more and, and get my teeth into it but what I will okay. say just going back to the posts that you were talking about I um I started off with the business doing my own posts and then I kind of outsourced it to a VA and it was very um information led but no call to action and then mm -hmm. I moved it on to being much more personality driven which really drove engagement but didn't give me any sales 
And then I tweaked it ever so slightly under the guidance of yourself and Marianne, as you know, and got a sale out of that one particular post. So mm. it 100% works. And I think it's just having the time and the inclination is probably more the problem for me right now. Okay. To get that got... content out there. Okay. Well, that's part of the sales strategy. Now, Jan Hoffman, you either put your thumb up or you were covering your camera. I don't know if that was either or. Can I come to you, Jan, to check? Do you have a sales strategy or were you just moving your thumb around for me? I'm not sure where that was. Um, yes, of course, I understand you. Um, but we uh, have... Um, I'm always one year in this company here and i have no idea who is our strategy so i must working with our strategy to bring in um in forward so mm -hmm. i um take a look here and he hearing from your strategy what we can do here in the next time okay so i don't have any uh, ideas from our strategy here in this department where i'm sitting here Okay, no problem. It's not unusual, by the way. I've got B-F-A-H-Y, so I don't know who B-F... I, I can't pronounce that. I'm assuming that's just initials of some sort. So you, but do Brian. you introduce yourself and tell us uh, about your sales strategy, please? Yeah, hi, Nick. It's Brian Fahey from ESI. Of course it is, Brian. Hi, sorry, I didn't recognize you. Your headphones yeah. on. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, we, uh, we were at the event that Kevin organized yeah. in IPS in, in, in the Northeast. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, our sales strategy we adopted from... Um, a company called ITT, uh, mm -hmm. they paid McKinsey uh, $20 million to come up with an engineered approach to selling. Mm -hmm. So everything else could be engineered, why not um, the sales process? Okay. So it's called value-based commercial excellence. And the whole uh, concept of it is that your resources are so important. And if you allow your resources to be taken up by your day-to-day -day activities, uh, you'll never get anything done. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, take your head out of the sand and uh, be strategic and the concept is you plan your sales calls a year in advance. Hmm. Uh, you know where you should spend your time. You pick your top 10 uh, potential customers where you should want to be. Uh, and then you actually pick 10 people in each of those sites. And then you form a strategy uh, around setting your resources to, to spend your time on, 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 on where it will give you most benefit according to three basic things, which is you have an ability to meet their needs. Uh, they have money to spend or they're strategically important. Mm. So it's about bringing on potential customers rather than waiting and sitting back with the customers you have. Absolutely. And in the meantime, looking at content, you may pick up other things that come to you that weren't in your strategy, but that's icing on the cake, I guess. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the presence of greatness. That's a fabulous uh, uh, way of approaching it. And, you know, as you say there, it starts with the fact that you know exactly what you're looking to focus on. I'm going to show you a very basic way, and that goes to anyone who's, who doesn't really know whether they've got a strategy or not. And it always starts with a simple who, what, why, where, when, how, etc. So, and it, it, whether you call it, you know, value engineered or whether you do it as a, as a the, the back of a, a post-it note, you know, who do we need to be talking to? What What is the communication going to be? What is the conversation going to be shaped like? Where are they based? Because that might have a factor on whether we can service them, we want to work with them. Is there anything that's going to influence me on a calendar basis around when to best approach them? So whether there's cyclical buying uh, um, activity, whether there is um, year-end budget spend or whatever, why should they listen? That's really, really important. And why have I chosen to target those particular people? And then the last one, which goes back to the content strategy, is how do I get at them? Now, what I'd say to you is that's a very simple starting point. And there's a huge amount of engagement options these days. I want to share with you a couple that maybe you're not trying with existing or potential clients. The phone seems to have been replaced by the Zoom. Now, what happened to, I'll pick up the phone and have a conversation with you. It doesn't have to be Zoom. We've all gone, let's have a Zoom. Well, Zoom's great, but Zoom usually takes three times as long as a phone call. And sometimes a phone call is just what you need to do. You can do emails and e-shops that are targeted. I'll explain some of the things we've just been doing for a different client recently that were involved around uh, that kind of approach, which is still a bit old school, but does the job. Social media engagement through connecting on LinkedIn, posting things on other channels if you're uh, appropriate for different channels that may be uh, uh, relevant for you. Um, 
messaging platforms. Now, how many of you use things like um, WhatsApp to engage customers? Do any of you have a WhatsApp customer? Uh, George, can I ask you to unmute, please, George? How many customers would you have in a, um, a WhatsApp kind of um, group or a WhatsApp connection? Can you hear me okay, Nick? Yes, I can, George, yeah. Good. Um, WhatsApp, I, I, me personally, I see it as a bit more informal. So we have a lot of our distributors and resellers um, mm -hmm. from various areas around the globe, certainly on WhatsApp, because it's quickly to access them, ask yeah. questions, provide information. So I don't tend to have too much WhatsApp conversation with end customers mm -hmm. although there are exceptions but it's generally with distributors and resellers that we're always in contact with every day what i like about whatsapp is the informality of it and what i'd say to any of you once you've got customers on board where the relationship's friendly and active and relaxed then think about whatsapp as a way of engaging with them because everyone's busy they'll probably yeah. appreciate it and it saves time at their end and your end so it's one of those where it's worth exploring the connection, the relationships you've got, because WhatsApp, the informality of it is good. Yeah. Cult culturally, it works in other countries really well. And also, it's just quicker and easier than sometimes having to type out a full, full blown email or you know, message or whatever. Um, yeah. Obviously, we're using Zoom and Teams, etc. You can still do physical visits occasionally. Um, and sometimes I do what I call hybrid meetings. I did one on Monday. I was in Liverpool. Um, we did a, uh, I was working with a client in a socially distanced room and we had the video suite on and we had 26 engineers from around the UK. So there's loads of options. What you've got to think about is which is the one or two that's going to give me the best chance of success. And what I mean by that is the best chance of moving the dial, moving the conversation, moving the opportunity further forward. And when we get frustrated by people not responding to emails, then try something informal. Maybe try, you know, sending a, um, a, a, a message through WhatsApp or whatever. If you're getting very limited feedback on an email trail, try moving it to a Zoom call because you'll get more information. Do the right thing. It does base sometimes on what a customer's preference might be, but if you don't ask and you don't consider it, you won't move the dial forward on that. Now, this is one of my favorite areas of sales. It's one of the most under, well, it's one of the most underfunded areas of sales quite often in organizations that I work with. Now, um, you would you would say um, from ESI, uh, Brendan, you would say that your prospecting is, you don't need a huge resource to do that because you, you're prospecting 10 organizations, 10 people, in the, it's quality research, it's not volume research, isn't it? So it depends on what your requirements are for numbers, but it's never been easier than now to get through. I'm gonna show you a shortcut trick for LinkedIn in a minute for getting people on board. So you've got loads of options and you've got to think about what gives you, the potential supplier, the quickest and easiest route and the quickest and easiest win. I'm still a fan of top 20 lists. So if I'm looking at uh, working with, um, well, I'm, I'm working for a client at the moment and we are uh, targeting um, NHS trusts and care homes, we've got a, a, a manufactured face shield, which has got CE marking, European standard, it's reusable, it's a game changer over the cheap stuff that gets thrown away every day. Um, but our target audience is care homes, top 20 care homes, UK, bang, list comes out. That starting point is for, for, for easy. I'm going to show you about connecting a post to your LinkedIn request. I'll show you that in a, in a screen in a second. But then the other one is exporting your LinkedIn data. Put your hands up if you're active on LinkedIn. Put your hands up if you're active on LinkedIn. Well, a lot of you, okay? Let's pick one. Uh, let's go. Um, who put that? Put your hands up again, because you all put them up, then put them down again. Let's go Mark, okay? Mark Gladys. Mark, unmute for me. Uh, how many, okay. roughly, I'm not going to hold you to it and count them, but roughly how many LinkedIn connections have you got? Uh, 3,600. Okay. So that's a chunk, isn't it? 3,600. Yeah. Do you, know, do you know those 3,600 people personally? 
No, but it's been one of my main strategies. To be yeah, honest. no, it's fine. By the way, I've got, six, whole, I've, got six, I've got six thousand seven hundred. I don't, you know, it basically, yeah. it's a, sometimes it's the numbers. Have you ever exported your LinkedIn connections? Yes. Yeah. And what do you do with it when you export them? My whole, my whole background. Um, I've come from an engineering background, I've become commercial in the last three years. Mm -hmm. and my whole um, attack and the way I've done things is through research, understanding the markets. Yeah. Um, Predominantly, I was marine. I was marine product manager, which is the role that Josh is sort of doing now. Yeah. Um, but I made sure I knew that market inside out, and I've come at it from every single angle. So all um, the play all the players, all the businesses, all the main people in those. Yeah. Are and and yeah. doing untraditional methods, so um, getting the full value from from the equipment itself. So most people use it purely for. It's all about tool meters. They use it mostly for taking power from an engine. Instead, we've now evolved and we work with propeller manufacturers for looking mm -hmm. at propeller condition. We look at paint manufacturers for hull condition. Um, we've gone on to work with people like Lloyd's Register who are doing um, work for cruise ships where they're looking at performance of Boscat fins on propellers. We've okay. And have you, got have you got connections across, going back to the LinkedIn piece, have you got connections across that whole piece? Yeah. That's yeah, and all the groups, and we share all the latest technical white papers, technical journals, into the into the the main groups for the um, areas within LinkedIn as well. Okay, um, actively post on there regularly. What, what, um, I'm going to stop you there, Mark. I'm I'm, I'm conscious that I want to explore the exporting bit. There's lots of people on here who've never exported their LinkedIn connections, and whether you've got a hundred or you've got a thousand or six thousand or more. When you export your LinkedIn connections, it's amazing sometimes to think, I can't remember why, but I've got all of these people here. So I'll take my business as an example. I've got 6,000 odd connections. I export them and I sort them immediately by job role. So all yeah. of my sales directors are together, all of my uh, group training directors are together, all of my CEOs, all of my MDs, et cetera, together, which then allows me to look and say, What's the value of that current 6,000 plus yeah. connections? What am I going to do with that strategically? So exporting your LinkedIn, I, I'm connected to the group um, head of um, sales development for Coca-Cola in Atlanta. Can I remember how I connected to her? No, but I do know that I've got one step closer if I want to engage with Coca-Cola in Atlanta with someone of potential relevance. That's just the starting point of that. Thank you for that, Mark. Just, just yeah, yeah. So, so mine personally, I've put into an international list. So I've yeah. got every broken into region globally, um, their role within the company, um, and who's the DMUs within each of those individual companies. Well, you're already you're already you're already closer to them because they've accepted some level of of of. of uh, awareness of you whether it's even just a yes i'll, I'll, I'll accept your connection uh, you can do linkedin searches post i think when people post stuff on linkedin a lot of people just ignore they look at the numbers the numbers are not relevant it's the quality of the people it's the quality of the people i'll come to you in a second Owen. it's a quality of people who um have either commented or shared or liked that post i'd look at that and i'd say i'm going to that's somebody really interesting who've, who've interacted with my content. I'll come to you in a second, Owen, won't be a second. But what I'd say to you is, it takes time to put the effort and energy in, and it takes time to do prospecting justice. I'm gonna show you one quick thing in terms of a LinkedIn connection request, and then I'll, I'll come to you, Owen, on that basis. What I've started to do is, you only get a certain amount of characters in a LinkedIn connection request. I always personalize them, but, what I've started to do is link something in that connection request to either a white paper, a landing page, or a piece of uh, um, uh, content, because I want them to see more than, hi, do you want to connect with me? So this guy, Lee Fryer, is a commercial and stadium director at Middlesbrough Football Club. I happen to be a Middlesbrough fan. Football is going to be allowing, well, it was going to be allowing people back into stadiums from October. And all I wanted to do was raise awareness of this face shield being a potential opportunity to protect players, staff and stewards when the public are allowed back in. So all I've done with that is, I've mentioned the fact that I'm a Middlesbrough fan, which is fine. I wouldn't do that to anybody else because that just makes you you know, sad. Um, but basically, I put a link into the face shield uh, case study on the website 
and, and ping that across to Lee. That allows Lee, that allows Lee to look at that and say, okay, I'll accept the, I'll accept the invitation. I'm not naive. I do know that he might have just gone, yes, I'll accept. My view is, from a sales professional's point of view, he's accepted because he's got some level of interest in that landing page, that content, that additional piece of information. Because the connection request itself doesn't give you enough characters to make a case. It's just 170, whatever number you get. So putting something in that lands them on the right place I want to ask you, where would you, a question for you, and I'll come to Owen in a second, where would you take somebody as a first connection on LinkedIn, where would you land them in a connection message? If you said, hi, you know, my name's Sarah, I'd love to w talk to you, explore how we might be able to work with you, and you put a link to something in there, I want you to think about where would you link them to? Where's the best place? Is it on your website? Is it an animated video on YouTube, on your channel? Is it um, something specific? What would you do with them? Because I guarantee now putting a connection request with some content link in there elevates the acceptance level dramatically. But you've got to know where you want them to go. So let's say Karen Tinkler from, from Partners PR, you've got your website, you might say, our about us page has got more on our personality or we'd like them to land on our services page or we'd like them to look at a case study we've done for a similar business which is also on the website that's the link don't make them look for it don't put them to your website to find it put them to the specific place you want to land them because that will help them and i guarantee your connection levels increase but also that initial engagement has been moved across the dial a little further because they've seen a reason why you want to connect with them. Where's Owen? He put his hand up a little while ago. I apologize. Where have I lost him? Where's Owen? Sorry, sorry, Nick. Hi, it's Owen here from USA Technologies. Yeah, yeah, hi. I'm having trouble with my camera at the moment. Oh, okay, no, we do. Um, do you have a question? Kind of half got a, got a hit. I do, yeah. Um, you kind of half got ahead of me there with regard to LinkedIn. I know that what we found in ESA Technologies is that when somebody comes in with a potential inquiry and mm -hmm. um, they're already aware of us, yeah. what, we, what, what we tend to do is we use the LinkedIn to respond to that email and that's the way we connect. So we say to them, thank you for your email. And as you say, we use a YouTube link mm -hmm. then to the particular product that they were inquiring about. Yeah, so at least you've already... Um, connected with them. And this in turn becomes your own personal uh, CRM system it on does. your own phone. It so does. even if you don't have a number for them, you can still make contact with them through LinkedIn if you're outside the site or if you're on site. Hi, right. I'm on site at the moment. Just thought you might like to catch up regarding that X, Y, and Z, you know? And I think it is about taking the content further than just the, you know, hi, do you want to connect or, you know, whatever it might be. It, it is about driving them to where you want to drive yeah. them. I quite like that idea, by the way, Owen, of, of, of responding to an yes. email, initial email. I presume you send an email and say, I've sent you a LinkedIn request as well, because a lot of people, you've got to assume, don't, they're not as active as you or I might be on there. So even though you, they're, they are on LinkedIn, it might just wither on the vine, it might die a little yeah. bit. In, in the in their inbox so you've got to be a little bit careful that you don't use that channel for that purpose so let's look at some initial engagement options i'm going to give you something to do in a second okay so we've talked about linkedin messages personal email yeah. i'm not a big fan of mass e-shots some businesses do them i'm not a fan never have been you can pick up the phone you can do zoom or similar but here's the question this is where the game's changed we are all zoom competent totally zoom competent now because I'd like to have had shares in Zoom in February, by the way, but we are all Zoom competent. Zoom's been around forever. So our Skype, uh, Teams is relatively new, but we're all capable, okay, of using the technology. So what I'd say to you is, how, how many of you have ever, since you've learned the technology and you're confident with it, some of you have not got your video on, so you're clearly very ugly. So, I, you know, I don't know, no, I'm only joking. You're clearly sort of you know, bad hair days or whatever or bandwidth, I'll go with that. But how many of you have recorded a video message to either existing customers, prospective customers, 
or people that you want to follow up from in some way, shape or form, a personalized one minute video message. Any of you have done that during the lockdown period? Because the skills are there because you're already on, you're already on Zoom now. So the simplicity of it is you open a Zoom call with only yourself on it, you press record and you record your message. Now, because people are not bothered these days anymore about production values so much, they're okay to go, yeah, that's a great, a one minute, a one minute landing page message to clients, prospective clients, follow-ups has got so much more power than sending an email or even a, you know, a WhatsApp or whatever it might be. So yesterday I did a piece of work with a client and I said to them, if you've got a prospective new customer, what would you say to them? What would you do and what would you say in a one minute video? And I'm going to give you the same exercise to do in a minute because I want you to think about what are you selling? Would you, would, you, would you come straight out the blocks with your technical capability? Would you come out the blocks with the relationship build? Would you come out the blocks with, well, what would you come out the blocks with? I'm going to, I'm going to show you in a second. I'm talking about WhatsApp and Instagram. But you've got to think about getting yourself noticed. If I receive a video message, either as a link in an email or embedded in an email, I'm more intrigued and I'm more likely to watch it. And you can say so much more in a video message than you can say in a, you know, in, in, in any other form of, of medium. So what I want you to think about is this. I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking to you. I'm going to ask you to just jot down. I don't want a full script, but I'd like you to think about if you were going to create a video message, choose your type of customer. It's up to you. Choose the scenario. It's up to you. Choose who you would potentially target. It's up to you. But what would you say? So what kind of things would you talk about? in that video one minute script if you like okay because i'd like you all to think about creating a one minute video that you can then either use generically or just re-record i like the content i'm just going to re-record it i'm going to say mark at the front or i'm going to say sarah at the front i'm going to say jonathan at the front but the rest of the video i'm happy with because video um messaging is not the it's not the domain of the technical people anymore it's the domain of anyone who's got a zoom account or a teams account and they can press record so what would you say okay give you a few minutes to work on that We'll be looking for a volunteer or two, but um, I'm probably going to pick on one without a, a video and one with a video. Think about inspiring your audience. I hate the phrase elevator pitch, but it's like a video elevator pitch of some sort. Or you might choose not to go elevator pitch. You might just choose to go personal around, you know, I've done some research. I'd like to work with you. I'd like to explore an opportunity, etc. Your choice completely. So who wants to go first? Patrick Dala, are you still writing? I'm still writing, yeah. yeah. Okay, no, I'll, I'll let you, we'll come back to you then, Patrick. Um... Charlie, you're not writing. Do you not want to do it? Unmute bottom left. Sorry, man. Sorry. <laughs> Unmute is the first one to do it. Um, no, I don't want to because I've, I've, written, I've written what I think questions to myself, but I've not mm -hmm. written what I would say. Okay, that's fine. No problem. Who has, who has 
created a masterpiece of a video script that they would love to share with the world. Come on. I'm looking at Jonathan Edmund. Oh, Richard, Richard from Sinex. Jonathan, you dodged a bullet there, Jonathan. I was about to go, Jonathan Edmund. I'll come to you then, Jonathan. In a lucky second. me, lucky me. <laughs> but Richard, yeah, but Richard, Richard saved you for the first one. So Richard from Sinex, talk to me, unmute, bottom left. Tell me who you would want to talk to by video uh, message. What kind of, what would be the scenario? Well, as you know, we, we sell various types of equipment. So obviously it's, it's choosing the, the right person and the right piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So a minute really would be an introduction, the product range that we sell that we think is going to be good for you, the actual product which you need or we think you need, and then a close. Okay. The thing I'd say about that is that's quite a traditional approach. Not Nothing too wrong with that, except it might be a little bit early. So I think traditional sales used to be We've got a product, we think you should have it, do you want it? And that's how it used to work. Now it's much more about, we've been doing some research, we've investigated the market, we've got a really good solution that you may be interested in. And I just thought I'd like to share that opportunity with you to explore. So it's a sort of a softer, it still has the same softly, outcome. Softly. It's more of a, so, that might be too quick, too sort of, you know, too direct, too early, but... Uh, <laughs> Can I come to Jonathan? Jonathan, sorry to, uh, um, you did dodge an earlier bullet, but we'll, 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 put you back, we'll put you back in the firing line. What was your scenario? What would it be? Uh, I would probably focus on um, like technical people, consultants or stuff like that. We work in the process industry. So, so you've got to think about what are they interested in. So what would, yeah. you say, what would you say to me as a potential first time engagement? Well, as a first time engagement, I don't think I would contact you since you're not in our business. But <laughs> let's say I'm focusing on the, the technical solutions and I would come to you with a new type of product or solution and or like uh, show you that we have got this new kind of product mm -hmm. and we know that you often run into these kinds of problems would you yeah. be open to have a discussion regarding this subject or okay uh, just a quick showing that we have a solution to this problem that we know you encounter the only word i'd change in that kind of approach is no because the, the people don't like to be told what you think they know i would use that and say, i like the approach though jonathan it's you know we've devised or developed a solution for a particular problem it's likely that you're probably going to encounter a similar kind of problem. So it's almost like a, I'm not telling you what your, your job is. I'm not telling you what your market looks like. We've got an assumption that you're going to you know, come across the same challenge. And I'd like to, I use the word a lot. I'd like to explore how we can, how we can, you know, potentially uh, discuss working together or discuss how we could support your potential requirements so oh and yes uh, a question from you nick i was just thinking there yeah I, you make a good point about sometimes we always go in about our company and what we do yeah when we should be concentrating on sometimes what the customer needs uh one i was been thinking about should because sorry, I'll, 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 I'll let you finish you should be concentrating approach. sorry you should be concentrating on what you perceive their challenges are because your company will solve those challenges yes. yeah 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 yes so the one i was thinking about recently was that we in esi technologies supply equipment process equipment to our customers and my idea was that we would put a pitch or a one minute video and just thinking about it as you said that regard to the times that we're in now unfortunately with covid uh, do you want to be able to monitor your equipment remotely? Mm. We have a solution. Yeah, brilliant. Because it is a challenge. You know, so I think that would, that would be something that would... It is. So do you want to monitor your control valve and your pump and see how they're performing from your kitchen table? We have a solution. We've just done one. Um, the service, the service director of one of my clients, they, um, they, they've got 21 service engineers out on the road and some of their clients, their call out rates dropped quite significantly. And it was due to the fact 
we'd done the research that people were nervous of having external service engineers on site and thinking, mm, you know, what about COVID and what about social distancing, etc. And the service director recorded a one minute video that said, basically on the, along the lines of, you know, this is, this is who we are. We've got a service contract with you. We haven't been to see you for a while. You may be nervous of, 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 of external contractors and here's why you shouldn't be. Three reasons why you shouldn't be nervous of us being on site. We'd like to make sure we, we, we maintain compliance of your equipment. Sent it out and she got about six inquiries within 10 minutes. All right, you can work safely. Right, good. So you've answered a problem that they understood from their research. It's all about being um, someone of value and relevance who understands the customer environment. And that's really, really important. So that worked really well. Just saying, you know, if you're nervous, we understand, but here's why you shouldn't be. Here's the three things that we'll do on site to protect you, your staff, your business, and they do a lot of work at schools in terms of some of the maintenance stuff and we make sure that you know we're working completely and utterly. We are passionate about safety and security and it, it just worked a treat. It was a very simple one minute message. So think about the power and it was just recorded on Zoom, no particular you know lighting and no particular production values, but it works a treat. Um, the next thing I'm going to say in the next stage of the sales cycle for me is when you get some level of interest, a chemistry or a scoping discussion. I've just had one this morning with a, 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 one of my clients um, is involved in asset tracking. So if uh, we do a lot of work in the NHS and other businesses who've got large value assets that are moving around and it's basically a tracking and monitoring system that uses various technologies to um, bring together on a, a dashboard where stuff is. So is it, where, whereabouts is the, is the location? Is it in maintenance? Does it work? And you know, whatever it might be. And we just had a, um, a it was a, it was a Google, a Google meet. So it wasn't even Zoom or Microsoft, it was a Google meet. But I didn't say to the guy when he made the inquiry last week, can we have a Google meet? I said, we need to have a Google meet or we need to have a, a, a Zoom call. If you ask permission and say to somebody at an early stage where they haven't really got a relationship with you, can we have a Teams meeting or can we have a Zoom call? You may get a negative answer. Could you just send me an email? Could you just put it in a, um, a phone call? So don't ask permission. Tell people this is how we work. It's what we do. And what we did this morning, we shared screens, we presented some uh, front level solutions, visually very appealing, and we've moved the we've moved the conversation four steps further than we ever could by sending something as a document, a PDF, or whatever it might be. So don't ask permission. That's your process. Now it comes to the stage where you're pitching your proposition, okay? And I've put here what an opportunity, and the opportunity's changed because of COVID and it's changed because of Zoom Teams, Google Meets, Hangouts and all that kind of thing. But people haven't changed with it. So I think what you're gonna think about is, if you're gonna inspire somebody in, a, in an initial conversation, an initial pitch, you need to know what you've got collateral wise ready to bring to the table. I'm gonna share a screen, I'm gonna share a video, I'm gonna share something in terms of, uh, of additional information, a powerful infographic, for example, or a piece of animation. All of those things allow you now, which you would never have done in traditional sales, you would probably in traditional sales have gone to a meeting, taken some notes, gone away and prepared a proposal, and then sent the proposal on to them. You can blow somebody away in terms of their visual and, 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 and engagement impact at the very early stage of engagement, with some really just thought provoking graphics, statistics, video, animation, etc. Um, I've got a question for the group. Which of you have got a really powerful, short company video, whether it's animated or whatever, live action? How many of you got a really powerful uh, company video that, that, that you believe in and, and, and find? Yeah, okay. 
I come to George, although you're, Mark, George and Josh, you're all for the same company, aren't you? I come to George, go on George, put your hand up. What, tell me about your video. What, is, it, is it live action, is it animation? What's it about? So uh, this, this video is actually, a, it's a rendered video, it's animated, um, and it's to do with Mark and Josh's key industry, the marine industry, and it highlights um, how our system works, how it can benefit the ship owners, uh, shipyards, um, all the, like I said, all the key benefits, how easy it is to install, how easy it is to use, um, and how it can help the customer, basically. Okay, and how long is the video? I think it's about two minutes. Okay, two minutes. That's that's sweet that's spot. It, yeah. Sweet spot, perfect. You cannot, however good a salesperson you are, cannot do that video justice by replacing the video with the spoken word. The video has been designed for a purpose, hasn't it? It's yeah. Visually attractive. It's engaging. If it's animated, it might be quite sort of quirky, which is great. Yeah, but we have a lot of foreign um, customers, so it's a universal language. Everyone understands it. Exactly. Visible. Okay. Yeah. So think video when you come in, think infographics when you're pitching your initial proposition. But the other thing, the other thing that I want you to think about is this is just a simple individual one page decal. This is part of my business. Okay. So I deliver, I deliver. If you look at the outside circle, I'm going to explain why I don't use that first, but essentially it's my online business. Okay. So it's about creating accessible, inspiring content that's expertly hosted and delivered. So that's what we start with in terms of conversation. We create, deliver, inspire, and evaluate the content. And we happen to do a sales academy, webinars, coaching programs for emerging talent, facilitated workshops, what are you looking for? So in, in effect, what I'm saying to you from a visual point of view is it's so much easier with pitching because of the shared screen, because of video, because of the availability of content that we traditionally would never have really accessed. So I'm going to talk to you about impact and why people buy. I'm going to show you a short three, it's a three minute video, an instructional video around why people buy. Okay. So I'm going to show you this and uh, I'll just leave it to, to play. Is your baby ugly? Wow. That's quite a question, isn't it? It's a question I often feel like I'm asking when I work with the businesses I work with when I particularly try to understand why they exist and what makes them different. So I will work with an organization. I'm going to see them and I'll say, tell me about your business. Invariably, they will come up with the same old story that everybody else comes up with. They'll say, we make this product. We are great at this service. We are fantastically knowledgeable. We are capable, technically gifted. We know what we're doing. We've been around since 1997, et cetera, et cetera. And what I say is nobody cares. So that's like me going to an organization where the business owners have invested life, time, money, energy, blood, sweat, and tears and saying nobody cares. So am I saying that your baby's ugly? I guess to some extent I am. The reality is they're getting it wrong because they're not focusing on the impact of what they do so much as the service or product that they provide. I just want to inspire you with a little thought process. People don't buy what you do, they buy why they should buy from you. Let me give you an example. My business, Impactus Group, does three things that no one cares about, including me. We do training, coaching and consultancy. And I'm bored telling you, and you're bored listening. The reality is, we are all about inspiring performance excellence in teams, individuals, and in businesses. And I always start with that. When someone says to me, tell me about your business, I always start with the impact statement, the why. We inspire people to performance excellence, individually, teams, and across the business. The next natural question, is how do you do that? And that is where you talk about the process by which you deliver your impact. So in my case, it's a four stage process. People, process, profile, and profit. The people side is assessing their skill sets, their capability to, to learn, to be upskilled, 
those kind of areas. The process is looking to see if the business is fit for growth, ready for growth, or whether growth will create any challenges or problems. The profile is looking to say, does this business stand out in terms of the language it chooses, the position it takes, and how they communicate their unique selling points and brand in the marketplace? And the fourth one, profitability, is the end game I'm looking to achieve for that client. In reality, doing that through providing sales, leadership, management, or business development, coaching, training, or consultancy is just the end game. Start with the why, lead to the how, finish with the what you do. Never ever start with introducing yourself as, my name is Trevor, we are an accountancy practice because people don't care what is the impact of your accountancy practice, what is the impact of your product, what is the impact of your business for the customers that choose to buy your products. Why, how, what, hopefully that's useful for you. Try it, refine it, learn it, use it. Okay, it's a very simple concept, but when somebody says to me, to some of my clients, what do you do? There seems to be an automatic answer to tell them what you do. So we provide marine technology specialisms. We're a PR consultancy. We deal with HR or we do recruitment or what. We, we're, a, we're a print uh, um, uh, engineering company, etc. The problem with that is, in these day, this day and age, they already know that in most cases. And secondly, there's no impact on that basis. So what I want to talk to you about is when we've done the opportunity, to this, the next stage of the process wow, is we get, we get the chance to pitch and create a proposal. Now, what I say to you, the proposal is most proposals I still see, even from technical organizations, are word documents, some visuals, a price, and it's sent as a PDF. Now, what I say to you on that basis, two things for me are wrong with that. One is if you create a proposal that you then, even if you jazz it up with nice visual images, etc., is it doesn't, it still looks quite a flat document. It doesn't usually inspire people. And if you send the proposal over to somebody, you've lost all control about how they interact with your content. So thinking about creating in PowerPoint or Prezi or other visual uh, media is much, much more powerful. So for example, this is one of my clients, Floki Health, okay? They create their presentation, their, their proposals in PowerPoint. So you've got a nice front page, front page you've got a picture of the, the product in use, you've got nice color screens in terms of uh, converting to PDF, embedded video, visual case studies, lots, lots more powerful than a quotation template or a proposal that is just technically um, packed but really hard to read or get inspired by and the reason that I want you to create something visually impactful is because how you use it that's just an example of one of my clients visual so this is the pitch for your proposal okay never ever send your proposal to a client who sends proposals to clients? You've done a proposal, who sends them to clients? Give me an example, who sends them to clients? So quite a few of you. Who doesn't send them to clients then? Who, who, who doesn't, see? Karen, you don't send them to clients. Okay, can I ask you why you don't send them to clients? For exactly the reason that you said that it, you lose control of the process and then it's, were you following up and feel like you're being a pain saying, did you get my email? Have you read my document? And it just what feels... Uh, and how are they going to read the document, by the way, when you're, if you just send it to them? How do you mean? Well, what I mean is you've got no control over how they're going oh, to read yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Got, <clears> they can't got ask no questions. control over how they read it, which order, or they just go skim, skip, how much? And then they're not returning your call because they've looked at the price and they've said, yeah, it's a bit more than I was looking for, without even reading what the value proposition and the content was. They've looked and gone, oh, how much? You know, it's a bit more. So you've lost complete control by sending 
a document and if it's a boring document it won't get read if it's visually appealing it might do you can do more with pictures and more with visuals and if you're an engineering company you can put 3d sort of uh, pictures in there of your products etc but the important bit is presenting it back not not um sending it and i'll, I'll give you an example okay this is how you should be thinking about pitching your proposal given the technology that now is common, i.e. Zoom, Teams, etc. So the order of the content and how you deliver the content is vitally important. It's like the dance of the seven veils. You want to control which veil comes off first, okay? So you're controlling the reveal of the information and the flow. And the way I look at it, a headline proposal is, what are the challenges that we're trying to address in this proposal for you, a potential client? What options have you got to address that challenge? What of which would be us? What are we actually proposing as a solution, technically, uh, or whatever? What's the impact of working with us? And what are the projected outcomes? So my one, two, three, four, five stage, pro in headline format, I'm gonna present a proposal in that kind of style. What have I not covered so far? What have I not talked about so far? Anyone unmute and share? Cost, price. Not talked about price. I don't want to talk about price at all yet because I want to know now what's the response. I want to check their engagement. How does that look? What do you think? What's in terms of let's talk about the solution I'm proposing. Could you see that fitting with your business? Is there anything we haven't covered? What have we missed? What I'm then going to do is I'm going to say to them, so given we've identified your challenge, given we've identified the options you've looked at and we've proposed what we now believe to be the best option, the impact of which we've all agreed is going to be significant to your business and the outcomes are going to make a, a game changer. How much do you reckon that would cost to deliver that for you? And ask them. I'm going to talk about investment shortly before you reveal the price because it's not a price, it's an investment. I never talk about cost and I ask my clients not to talk about cost. I'll say to them, talk about investment in a solution. So Karen, you're, you do PR. When you're selling consultancy or you're selling advice and services, it's, it's often quite easy to do this, is to say, how much are you looking to invest in your business? Are you looking to invest in your business or are you looking to buy some PR? If you're looking to buy some PR, then it's always about how much is that, how much does it cost to buy PR? It's a very different conversation to say, are you looking to invest in the growth of your business using PR? You have a very different dynamic with the word investment and cost. But when you're presenting your proposal, because the technology is now available and we're very comfortable with it, if it's designed in PowerPoint, which we're all comfortable with, or Prezi, if you're you know, uh, uh, okay with that kind of format, nothing goes out to a customer where they can make an ill-judged decision just based on what they choose to look at first, which invariably in most cases will be, how much is this gonna cost me? And if that doesn't look right, the rest of it falls apart. The seven veil dance is gonna to get to the price, the investment, when I'm ready, when I know the room's ready for it. So we did this thing this morning with a, a, um, a company and we just talked about, tell us about the challenge that you're looking for and what you're looking to address. What have you looked at? And what's been the downside of the options you've looked at? So let's talk about what we would do. Let's talk about the technology we can bring to the table. And the guy said to us before we even mentioned anything else, he said, that ticks three massive boxes for me. He'd said that before we'd even discussed what it's going to cost him, what the investment's going to be in the technology and solution, because we handled the entire sort of pitch and proposal kind of scoping conversation. Um, in that manner it never it didn't become about price or investment it came about is that solution the right one for us the other reason for using zoom and teams is it's easier to handle objections up front and face to face but it's also about allowing you to negotiate better you can't negotiate by email if you say you can i'm going to disagree with you you can communicate by email but you can't negotiate by email you'll lose if you negotiate by email. So I'm gonna use a bit of word association. I apologize for those where English is your second language. If you don't know the, what this means, that's absolutely fine. 
And I'm going to say to you one word. I want you to write down what you believe the definition of that word to be, okay? And the word is assertive. Assertive. What do you think assertive means? And what does it mean to you if you were having a conversation with somebody? Being assertive. First thing that comes to mind, don't overthink it, okay? How many of you have got something like um, pushy or in your face or, you know, negative, sort of semi-negative connotations? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of people think assertiveness is pushy, it's your agenda, getting the job done for you, etc. And a lot of people think that. How many of you have got strong or confident or something of that nature written down? A number you got strong or confident, that's okay. Um, and that's if essentially what we're trying to achieve. My definition of assertiveness simply is this, win-win. I want to achieve what I want to achieve from a conversation, an opportunity, but I totally understand that I can't do it at the expense of the customer. But I also understand the customer can't do it at my expense as well. I'm going to pick on Sarah Birkinshaw because you sell time and expertise, Sarah, right? It's yeah. more for mirrors time and expertise, isn't it? You, you, how much do I pay for that expertise? It's not tangible. The guys and ladies who are making a product, it's a different dynamic. But have you ever, ever underpriced for a client and then ended up over-servicing them? Yeah. Yeah, of course you have. Now, how do you feel about that client ultimately when you're being asked to do more and more work for less and less return on that money? Well, you, you feel undervalued, don't you? Like they're taking the mickey a little bit. Yeah. And natural instincts are, I'll find a way of clawing that back. So what you do is you lose at the start to try and win at the end. And no one actually wins in that dynamic. You're looking at all the time in negotiation of saying, let's make sure that I go away from the conversation happy. Equally, my client knows I'm not, you know, I call the phrase lifting your leg in terms of price point. Because if that comes back and they find that to be unrealistic, then they're not going to be happy. And you end up with a, a one-win client rather than a relationship build client. So negotiation is really important to look at win-win, which is why I start with the, the sort of word association piece around assertiveness. Um, but I'm just going to talk to you about closing the deal and then dealing with objections. Closing the deal's easier face-to-face, eye-to-eye. Um, again, if you think, I call it doing the right thing, picking up the phone, um, setting a Zoom call, not sending an email, doing the one thing that's going to get you the opportunity to close that business. Historically, if you've gone face to face to close a deal, you have to go face to face now. You just do it through a different technology. So have any of you got a really good closing technique for people who are maybe... Let's say you're hard to read, okay? So let's say, oh, and I'm, I'm in discussions and negotiations with you and you've got a brilliant poker face. You're giving me absolutely nothing. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, have I read this guy right? You know, if I, if I push for the... So my natural instincts would be, are we going to go ahead? But if I've misread you, I'm thinking to myself, oh, and he goes... No, nowhere near yet. I've, I, there's a danger, isn't there, with asking for the business? There's a danger with being direct. And if you're particularly if you're not good at reading people, or people are particularly closed off to you, professional buyers potentially, uh, uh, they're they're on a course right now, learning how not to be sold to. I guess that's why we, we do this one. They're they're in a Zoom call somewhere else, out there learning how to stop salespeople uh, being effective. Um, Who's you got have, a good you have to continue. You have to, you have to continue fishing until you get more yeses than noes. That's, that's the end game, but I'm, I've, got a, I've got a little closing technique that I like to use. I like to use it for people who are not particularly direct or feel uncomfortable or not good at reading people. And the, uh, there's, there's a picture of a, an iron fist in a silk glove. What that means is it's really powerful, but they don't feel it coming. Okay, it's one of those where you're thinking, okay, I need to get to somewhere. And the phrase is quite simply, after you've said to them, I, I liken it to dating, okay? So let's say you're on a date with somebody and you want a second date, you want an outcome from the evening. 
you've got to remind them of the high points of the evening. You've got to remind them that you've been for a walk down by the river, you've chosen a nice restaurant, you've got things in common, you've had a laugh. The same with sales. You get to the end of the deal and the opportunity, you've got to remind people. So when we spoke earlier, you had this problem. We've presented a solution that looks like this. We seem to have got by in terms of um, the financials. We've answered all of your technical questions. You're reminding them of the high points of the discussion. And then what you say to them is, what do you want to do now? Where do we go from here? What do you want to do now? Where do you go from here? What it does is about 60% of people will just say to you, let's go ahead. But the other 40% will say, yeah, I'm not quite ready, or I need to have a board meeting, or I need to think about, that's fine, because you can then have a second attempt to say, what do you need from me to help you? What do you need from me to present to your board, or to your business, or to your, your partners? If someone says, I'm not ready, you know by asking, what do you want to do now? So on the date, Sarah and I are on a date, I apologise, Sarah, you can get trauma, you can get trauma counselling for that, don't worry. Sarah and I are on a date and I could say, I'm, you know, I've walked you home. I'm, I'm, old, I'm old school, Sarah. I've walked you home. And I'll say, what I've summarised, we've had a great evening, nice walk, you know, nice, uh, uh, good company, good fun. And I'll say to you, what do you want to do next? It's your choice, isn't it? You might say, oh, I'd like to see you again. There's the result you wanted. I'm not sure. Okay, what would I have to do to get a second date? Choose a better restaurant. Don't be so tight. Or, you know, um, or whatever it might be, but you'll tell me why you can't say yes. And that works better face to face than it does in an email. And I'm just saying, you know, the technology is available now. Um, I'm not Nick, just a question here from, from Brian. That one. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, Nick, just a question from Brian here. Um, so, they, um, uh, what's preventing you from moving forward? Is, is, that, is that kind of outdated or? or you're trying to find out is there anything in his mind that it that would follow on it would follow on from my question that brian i'd say if i say what's you know what do you want to do now and they say i'm not sure then i'd say so what is stopping you because that's you but 60 percent okay. of people go yeah actually, let's do it so it's a nice follow-on to that it is a bit old school as a one-off question i get it i get it when it, do, it does work but i'd rather go what do you want to do? I've summarised, well, what do you want to do? I'm on the doorstep with Sarah, what do you want to do now? And she might say, yeah, I'd like to see you again. She might say, not for me. And I said, oh, you know, can I, can I ask you, you know, what I've done wrong? Well, you, you know, I, do you want a list? She might, she, she might give me a list, mind you. Okay. Will so, I book the restaurant for the same time next week? <laughs> that's, that's the assumptive close, isn't it? So the assumptive, the assumptive close is, is it Indian next time or Chinese? And she said neither. That's it. <laughs> yeah, we're not teaching people how to be that, that pushy. So the other thing you got to think about is the dynamics on the other side of the table. Who are you negotiating with in terms of their job role? Now, there's a job role that people ignore in sales, and that is the information gatherer. Often in a bigger organisation, someone has been challenged by one of the directors to do a bit of research. Go and find out what's out there. You know, who could we be dealing with on this particular specialism or area of expertise? We're thinking of going into this particular area. Who could we be dealing with? And it's often quite a low level decision maker, non-decision maker's job to do that research. And I've seen it time and time again where a sales professional will treat that research level with disrespect. When well, you're not a decision maker, pointless, I don't need to impress you, don't need to inspire you, you're not a director, you're not going to make a decision, you're not going to you know, get me any further down the food chain. If you're dealing with somebody at that entry level, assessment level, information gatherer level, they are the ones who decide whether you make the cut they're the ones who decide whether you get on the, the, the CEO's desk. They've been challenged with finding out three or four providers and the CEO might say, so having dealt with those three or four providers, which two should I be talking to? And if you've not treated them with the same respect you would treat a director, you're not going to get on the final two. So don't be put off by someone at a potentially perceived lower level making inquiries of you because you don't know that they're not given the authority. I was with someone the other day 
and the, they said that the there was a, exactly the same situation, and the CEO um, had asked the, uh, um, a graduate intern to research a particular piece of the market, and the intern said one of the salespeople treated it like an absolute you know waste of time and piece of dirt really. So they didn't get recommended forward. It was a three hundred thousand pound job, and the CEO just said to this this this, this intern. Who should we use? Not who should I see? Who should we use? And the intern said, those for these reasons. He went, go on, let's do it. So that person who was perceived as a potential low-level influencer can have authority, but you must treat them with the respect they deserve simply because you don't know what the dynamics are at play at the other end. And, and I'm saying that because I've seen lots of salespeople from an arrogance position more than anything thinking, I only deal with directors. Well... You do when you get to the end of the game, but what if during the game you have to play with the, uh, the the people who are just researching? Find some champions or service users for your product, which is important, obviously. And then I talk about the impact of buying, but also not buying. Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, in uh, January 2018, changed supplier of refrigerated transport for all their chicken which is a great idea. Apparently it was going to save £120,000 over a year in terms of transport costs for KFC. It cost them four million quid plus, the worst PR ever, because KFC stands for Kentucky Fried Chicken. They only sell chicken and they ran out of chicken. They ran out of the one product they're supposed to sell because they gave the contract to somebody who didn't have enough refrigerated vehicles, but they were going to save money so the procurement people said, we'll save some money, but they didn't look and say, can you actually deliver the chicken? There's a little video on YouTube of a lady from the north of England, and it was such a, a disaster for her. She said, she's outside Kentucky Fried Chicken and the, the, uh, at the drive through and the guy says, we've got no chicken. And she's like, it's a disgrace. I've had to go to Burger King. So that's how bad it was that someone had to go to Burger King because someone who was a buyer in KFC didn't understand the impact of not buying the right solution. We need to think where somebody is in their decision-making process, need, want, or desire, and that's quite simply driven by timing and impact. So we all get a call occasionally from someone who's been let down. When was the last time any of you had a call from somebody who said, help? Any of you had a help call in the last? Any of you had a help call? Uh, M. Terry, I can't see because you got you're a bit of a silhouette because you got the, the the light behind you. Give us an example of the, the help call that you had to deal with. Uh, yeah, just a customer ringing with a piece of equipment that has failed, and uh, we've done enough to be the first point of that uh, reach out. And mm -hmm. invariably, what we try and do then is perform, and then we get remembered uh, in the next time round when he's investing again. So you could deliver the solution that got them out of the hall. Would that be right? Correct. If you couldn't, they ring the second one on the list, don't they? They never have to. <laughs> then they ring the third one on the list. Because when it comes to need, the only driver is impact and timing. It's, can you get it to me by Monday? Can you get it to me and sort me out by whatever? And the reality of that is, what's it not about? What's it not about at that stage? Investment. Price. <laughs> Investment, that's a good Cost. one. Price. But, yeah, thanks, sir. Brian. It's not about price, it's about fulfillment. I've got a problem, that problem exists, it's massive, can you get me sorted out? So you've got to assess the urgency in someone's tone. A want, these are where the difference between being a really good sales professional and being bang average comes in. A want is someone who's looking at potentially, potentially changing but they've, they've already got plenty of time in that process. They're in a contract or they've got lots of stock or they've got something in place that says the urgency isn't with me. You've got two requirements to find out when you're looking at sales on that basis. Why is today not the day? In other words, we, we, we're looking, but we're not ready to make a decision because we've got a stockpile of a thousand of these widgets. When those widgets run out, we're ready to change or we're in a contract till the end of December with some whatever. So why is today not the day? When might it be in our favor? Once you know when it's in your favor and your system pops up that reminder, you ring the guy and go, hi, Phil, we spoke in September. You had a thousand widgets left, said to give you a ring when you were probably gonna be down to your last 150. 
I'm ringing to sort that out for you. Want is brilliant if someone's serious, but only if they're serious. And if you actually find out why is not going to be a decision today and when might that be in our favour. So that's another sort of part of the, the negotiation piece. Uh, the closing piece, sorry. And then what you got to think about is um, link back to why your customers buy from you. I want to encourage all of you to find out why your customers spend money with you. Not why you think they do, but why they actually do. I did a piece of work for a company a while ago and their salespeople said, if you give me a better price, I'll sell more product and yeah, like they all do anyway. And I said, well, actually, I don't think that people are buying from you just on price and I'll prove it. So I rang 50 of their existing spending customers and I gave them a list of seven headings. And I just said, I did it on the phone and I put it into um, a survey monkey as a live survey. And I said, can I ask you the top three reasons you continue to come back to this particular business? And I read them in alphabetical order, so I didn't influence them. And I think there was things like availability, technical support, stock levels, um, customer service, price. I can't remember what they were. There were seven of them. Number three was price. Number two was technical knowledge of your guys. Number one was you always have it in. And I said to the sales team, when was the last time you ever used, we always hold the stock so you don't have to, as a conversation piece? And they said, We've never used that. We always talk about price. I said, if you talk about price all the time, you'll lose. Your customers value the fact that you've got the stock. Your customers value the fact that you know what you're talking about and that your price is there or thereabouts, not enough of a problem for them to go somewhere else. So if you understand why your customers buy from you, not why you think, but doing properly researched empirical evidence, you'll be surprised what you know. So I said, avoid focusing on the price, build around the package. And are they ready to buy if you get the package right? So one of the things I'll say to somebody, when they, I call it the price swerve. Somebody will say to me, how much are you going to charge? Somebody said to me, how much does your training cost? I'll say, it doesn't. Oh, why? I'm looking to work with people who want to invest in their teams. I do change it around there. But I will say to somebody, um, are you looking to make a decision about your training? Yes. Is that imminent? Yes, it is. So my job now is to make sure I get the package right for you, but I'm not going to give them that conversation about package and price unless I know they're serious. Because if you give them a package and a price too early, they're going to come back to you uh, when they're ready to buy and go, so right, I've got this price from September. What are you going to do for me in December? So make sure you're playing the game around negotiation on that basis. So the last part of the circle is account management and account development and collaboration. So having a strategy for that and managing your key accounts, okay? So I'm gonna ask you collectively, has anyone got a key account strategy where you've allocated people to look after key accounts just as a group? Any of you got that? Some of you will have, yeah? Mark, who, who, who's your, are you a key account or some of you guys key account guys? That's combination, so for distributors then we've got accounts each and second is on each account but then for the major accounts then George will deal with um, oil and gas in the US so I'll deal with um, automotive and marine uh, JP's got various marine ones that he works with as well so it's all spread so, and all so looking at George oil and gas America you're the oil and gas America guy George yeah okay that's what I want to see which is great so you're not distracted by anything else it's not oil and gas America have you got a strategy for growing those accounts then George um, I've, got, I've got dedicated tactics that I sort of learn off people that are around me and have the experience um, and people that we work with in the US as well. Um, I'm not, I mean, I don't dedicate all my time to them because obviously we, we share our time with them, each other's accounts as well when we're not here. So we do cover for each other as well. Okay. All right. Well, what I'd say to you about key accounts is this, okay? It's never been easy to keep in touch with them. Categorize them based on spend, capability, growth opportunity, etc., and give each one a defined communication program. So this, these clients get a quarterly call, these get a monthly Zoom, these get a, you know, when you could visit, you get a visit, etc., etc. Review meetings, hold them by Zoom. Use Zoom in between face to face. If you want to, instead of instead of doing emails and and and, and messenger services get close to your customers you know time zones are okay in, in your favor i guess apart from the far end you know maybe maybe the west coast is someone's up early or late on those george aren't they you know but that's okay we can live with that don't be frightened of using zoom 
But also what I find with key account customers is they often keep coming back to you with, how does this work? What's this? How does that? Frequently asked questions, as I call them. So what I do is I'll say to my clients, are you getting repeat conversations with some people that you can help and make them less, um, less demanding? And I mean that in a, in a good way by producing how to video guides, how to do this, how to do that. So the client I was talking about earlier with the, the service engineers, they've just produced a series of short, like some of 20 seconds, how to clean your motor, how to do this, how to whatever it might be. So instead of people ringing up going, George, you know, can you get one of your engineers to tell me how to do this? There's a little how to guide or a frequently asked questions video help guide. Um, make your meetings output driven and create momentum. So you're saying, right, before I ring this client, I'm going to look at what they buy from us, but I'm going to look at what they don't buy from us. And I'm going to put that on. That's what Brian was saying earlier about the, the, the strategic intent of, 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 of growing your business is knowing what products that you could sell into an organization, selling what the buy, you know, selling what they've, they've got, but looking every time, looking at the gaps and saying, what's the next thing on that radar, the next thing on the agenda, and maybe just try WhatsApp, Slack, or other messenger groups on that basis. So um, what I've said to you so far and, and all the way through is, you know, if you're using old style sales practices, you're probably going to find yourself being old style results and those old style results are just going to get less and less. So what we've always done doesn't necessarily work. You haven't got exhibitions. You haven't got face to face visits very often. You often can't invite people to have a look around the, 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 the facilities, etc. But clients have got more access to information. They're much more informed. So they're going to come to you based on already knowing what they're looking for. So maybe try some new channels to inspire them, video messages, WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. Change some working practices and be more visual, be more visible in terms of social media platforms, but more visual in terms of content and create sales processes that work for you, not just work for your clients. So um, I'm gonna ask anyone before you go, anyone who's part of the Indertrade family, the wider Indertrade family, can you make sure you put your email address in the chat function for me, if that's okay? If you haven't, I'd like to put that in there so that I've got a record of who's been on from Indertrade. Those who pre-registered through the normal system, I've got you on, on the, the Eventbrite system. Um, there's a, um, Phil, you joined late. I'll, there's a record, that's okay, there's a recording uh, of this which I'll post on youtube and make readily available so if you want to share it with colleagues or you know, if you missed any of it or whatever it might be or you had some internet connection issues so um as long as i've got the the um the email addresses in the in the, the chat function then we're okay with that um uh, thanks phil cheers any questions from anyone any thoughts any thank you some good contributions from all of you brian thank you for your uh, insights at the start as well and and, and thank for, thanks for that just a brief one, Nick, right? Uh, we were looking for a CRM system. So we yeah. benchmarked three companies. We did a list of 13 main requirements. Yeah. One company came back and a guy, Luke, created specific videos around our questions. Right. Just little videos taking us through how we would do things. Yeah. That was it. Didn't matter about anything else. That's the guy we, you know, we, we, we bottomed down on, you know? We buy like that. So why wouldn't your customers buy like that? Yeah. And, and, and you'll have been sat there watching the presentation and thinking those other two were rubbish, weren't you? Well, were rubbish. I, yeah, but I'm time poor, right? And uh, yeah. I'm trying to benchmark them. And he's actually given it to me on a plate. So all I had to do was watch those couple of little 40 second, 50 second videos and answered all my questions. The other two yeah. were, didn't even start the race. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love, I love stories like that because it is, people are, like you say, time starved, aren't they? And they're predisposed to want to make a decision because they've already made, they've already done the research, the further down the food chain than they ever were when they come to first touch with you, aren't they really? So yeah, okay. Any other questions, Any, anything else? I forgot, as long as I've got your email addresses um, and in, in the chat function, and I've got the ones who pre-book through um, Eventbrite, what I'll do is I'll make sure you get uh, a copy of the slide deck and I'll send you a link to the, um, I'll send you a link to the, to the, uh, the video as well, in case you want to use it back. So lovely to see some of you again. I haven't seen you for a while, Brian. Nice to see you. you I'm assuming you didn't get a chance to keep him well, are you? Keeping? 
All good. And uh, yeah, really interesting presentation. Thanks so much. Excellent. Rich is looking for a new CRM. There you go. Who, who did you use for your CRM, Brian? Who was, who was well, HubSpot is the one. Then we've we've ended up. Uh, we're, like, we haven't even got to the final price, but like we're going to go with them. They don't I, know that yet. I've got a client who uses that. It's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> good. They do now. <laughs> sales guy's going to have a good day when he get that call, isn't he? Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Good to see you Bye. all. See you, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.